ladies, welcome, and um, I hope you've had a really good week. Our week's been a little trying, but um, God's seeing us through. Um, anyway, we have a lot of people on our church that need prayer, and I just, uh, I think a lot of you are aware of them, but um, let's just bow our head and ask God to come with us tonight. Dear most kind Heavenly Father, we come before you with um, our Bible study that you will help us to be good stewards of your word. Help us to be um, children of yours that hungers for a relationship with you, Lord, in the best way that we know how to do. And I realize that all of us are in different seasons of our life. Some of us are brand new to you as a child. Some of us are old, and some of us are in between. Some of us are new moms. Some of us are elderly. Uh, some of us are in a season of our life where um, we're having to learn how to slow down because our bodies just won't let us do too much more than that. So we ask for guidance. We ask for um, wisdom in each of these seasons, Lord. We ask that you show us where we need to be and give us or help us use the tools that we are learning about to study your word and draw closer to you. Lord, we have a lot in our family that are hurting, that are ill and need your healing touch that are starting new seasons of their life, uh, even at the, um, at the uh, older end of our life, <laughs> we're starting new seasons. So I know you've taught us before that we are never stop learning. We always learn until we go home to be with you. So just thank you, Lord, that you don't leave us by ourselves and that you're with us each step of the way. Be with our world, our world right now. Um, it is really in a turmoil. What happened was not a good thing. People just don't use their heads anymore. And... Um, we're asking for justice for the young man uh, that was killed. And we're asking for wisdom for these people who seem to be so concerned but are reacting in ways that are harmful to, their, to themselves and to their neighbors, to their families, without even thinking, Lord. They're reacting. Remember how you told us to be slow to speak or be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And we just ask those uh, lessons for our lives right now. And for the ones that are leading us, that you will give them wisdom to know how to lead our country and to be a leader to others as well, a good example. None of us are perfect, Lord, and we all need your help. So we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Okay. Well, I hope you've been enjoying our study. Um, this is one of my harder weeks when I've worked the whole weekend and I've only had one day off. And this week, our one day off, uh, we had to put our little puppy down. Well, I guess he's not a puppy, but he was 15 years old and we had him for 12. Uh, 13 years of his life. So that was a very hard thing, a very emotional thing. And um, uh, anyway, it's just the harder part of the month. When I work all those days in between, I don't get very much rest. So if I act a little tired or, you know, not all together with it, please forgive and um, Listen to what God says and not what I say or, or anything like that. This is his word that we're going to learn to study. This is his word that 
he wants to us to apply in our life. This is his word where he's showing us himself. Um, and uh, he's showing us the kind of relationship that he wants us to have with him. Um, not just a fly by night. Uh, we don't want to be one of those seeds that don't germinate and grow. We want to be one that cleans and holds on to and sprouts out and becomes strong and blooms and blossoms for him with a fragrance that will touch others. And so, um, you know, as we're studying, that's what we're aiming for. We want to shine for him. We want our lights to shine. We don't want to hide them. I hope I'm talking loud enough. Um, our verse this week is just awesome verse. Uh, it's found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 24 and verse 27. It says, prepare your work outside. Get everything ready for yourself in the field. And after that, build your house. So God's telling us right here how to prepare to study for him. We've been learning to build Bible, Bible literacy by studying with purpose, preparation, or perspective, and patience. Uh, but as with any building project, a good process is also required. And the process that Jen wants us to uh, introduce us to us uh, is a really good one. It's um, as a student to carry the burden of not just reading but owning the text, be responsible and take ownership of the text as a child of God. This text, this Bible from Genesis Revelations is for us. And um, it was also for our ancestors that looked before us. Um, and now for us, and if God uh, delays his coming, it will be for the next generation. So um, it's, he, she wants us to take ownership of it as we're studying. And then of a tempting interpretation and application to our own life. Only after we've done all this, after we've read, after we've studied on our own, then we're prepared to use it outside study helps, uh, like our commentaries and um, uh, Bible studies, because we will already have um, what he's teaching us in his word to compare to those writings, to know when we're reading that commentary or that Bible study, if that person has applied themselves to God's word, if they're teaching us what God's word says, uh, or if they're having us chase another avenue that might not totally agree with God. Satan was very good at that, and he still is. I mean, he still makes lies look so good and so close to the truth that it's hard for us if we're not prepared to be able to distinguish the differences. So that's why it's important to study on our own first, ask God for wisdom, and for interpretation, help ask him, for us to ask him to help us with uh, seeing what he wants us to learn so that we can compare it with others. And we always go by God's word, okay? Uh, there are people who fly by the seat of their pants, they're called willy-nillies, and they don't use a step-by-step -step process, and the results can be a little hit or miss. Um, and I think all of us at one time in our life, and maybe several times of our life, um, study this way. And um, there are people who follow the process, no matter how hard or how long it is, step-by-step. -step. Um, letting it fall in order like you would when you're building a house. 
you get the right permits, you get all your, your supplies ready, you get your men in position, and you have a plan, a blueprint, I think it's called, of how the house is supposed to go together, and then you start your building. But you get all of that prepared ahead of time, and that's what we do when we study the Bible. And, um, uh, and, and Bible literacy is very close and similar to that process of building a home. But I want you to know it takes both willy-nilly steadiers <laughs> and those, the people that do the process step by step takes both of us um, to contribute their strengths to the body of believers. Um, that's just like people who are in different seasons of their life, uh, who are new, who are been in the church for a while. And you can be in the church for a while and still be new, <laughs> thinking that you're old, but you can still be new because maybe you haven't studied or followed the process. So, um, but it's um, very similar to that. So you would want to be the builder who subscribes to the step-by-step -step way. And that's the kind of builder um, that we must be in order to, to finally get to that, where we're putting all those little pieces together to make that big quilt or that big puzzle, um, you know, to, to help it all come together, to have a rock-solid foundation. Um, and not one that is built on sand um, or shifting sands. A good literacy builder honors the learning process of moving through three distinct stages of understanding. First one being comprehensive, or hension. Comprehension asks, what does it say? What does the Bible say? And then the second one is interpretation. And it asks, what does it mean? And then the third one is application. And it asks, how should it change me? How does God want it to change me? How does he want it to make me more like him? We actually move through these stages in intuitively in our everyday lives. And just one example she used that I thought was really cute. But uh, when your alarm goes off in the morning and you're dreaming really deep, you're sleeping really good, and you start hearing your alarm go off and your mind comprehends that it's not a train, it's not the garbage truck outside. <gasps> That's my alarm, okay? So what is that telling you? What's that interpretation? It tells you it's time to get up. It's 7.30 in the morning. That's what you had it set for. And then the application is, I've got to get up and get ready. I've got to get ready to start my day. I've got to get ready to get the kids off to school. I've got to get ready to go to work. Whatever it is that you're going to do and you have planned that day, that's what it's telling you. So that's the three processes there that you just do automatically. Your body and your mind are so set automatically. And I'm sure you can think of many, many others, um, but that's just one of them that she shared and I thought was really good and very easy and simple. Uh, comprehension is more objective. It seeks purposefully to discover what the original authors intended. Asking ourselves what does it say is hard work means we have to slow down. Um, we have to read and reread and make notes and ask questions. Um, you know, it's, it's not, you just sit down and read it once and you're done. Um, comprehension is really seeking out and trying to see what God's teaching. A person who comprehends the account of the six days of creation in Genesis uh, can tell you specifically what happened each day. 
And uh, the first step of comprehending what the text says moves us towards being able to interpret and apply the story of creation to our lives. So we'll see a little bit more about this in a minute. A good builder uses good tools, and the first tool being the Word of God. Uh, she gave a really good example about printing it out, and I had never, I guess, put that together. Uh, I know I put notes together, but printing out the Word of God, the scripture that you're reading, say it's Genesis 1, and you print it out, double space it, make room to make notes, excuse me, um, make room to um, oh, underline, uh, circle a word that's been said more than once. Um, the little, uh, let's see, you might uh, need a good set of colored pencils to do this. But, and, and when you come to a question, uh, like what does this mean, because you're not understanding what it means, use a red pencil or pen in the margin and big words, you know, make notes. So what does this mean? So you can look it up and find out later. Uh, repetitive uh, reading, this is a critical tool and I love this because I'm not good <laughs> at taking a verse and just memorizing it. I don't know why, but I'm not. And uh, repetitive reading is um, it attempts to build a comprehension because we won't be able to catch what the author is, in, is intended to communicate in one reading. There's a lot in one chapter of the book of Genesis. There's a lot, and in that whole comp, the whole book of Genesis is a lot. So, uh, rereading, getting familiar. Um, underlining, questioning, um, oh, what was the other illustration she gave? Well, when you, it's all, overall famil, famil, familiarity, <laughs> I can't say that word, with a text. Repetition is the very first learning strategy we employ as children. It's how we learn to speak, to recite, and to quote. Repetitive uh, reading helps us to memorize a verse without knowing what comes, oh wait a minute, help us memorize the scripture in the best way possible because it's within its original context. Caution, big letters. Uh, Any time we memorize a verse without knowing what comes before it or what comes after it, we run a very real danger of misapplying it. So it's always good to know what comes before that verse and what comes after so that we're, we're memorizing it and comprehending it in the way it's supposed to be taken. Not out of context, but in context. Very important. Uh, annotation is taking notes, uh, certain words, phrases, ideas that are repeated. Uh, develop a notation system that works for you. Uh, you might, uh, things, that, words that repeat, you might draw a square around or a rectangle. Um, let's see. Uh, or circling um, or different underlining different uh, truths, putting little icons like triangles, uh, stars, whatever, whatever it takes, whatever you want your system to be. It's even good to write it down on a piece of paper like your square, your circle, your triangle, uh, star, whatever you want to use on a piece of paper right next to it, what you're using that um, circle for. Okay, are you going to use the circle to circle all the words that repeat through the chapter? Um, are you going to put a square around all the places where it says Jesus said? Or therefore, because therefore is used uh, several times sometimes uh, in a paragraph. Um, 
be consistent. Use that graph and always revert back to it. Uh, so you're not uh, constantly trying to figure out, well, why did I put a square around that one? Or why is that one circled? You have it right here. This circle means this is what you're looking for. Um, so, you know, make your own little table up. Um, does the text that you're studying, does it make several points in a row? Uh, number each point as it is introduced in the text um, and draw attention to those points because those are key things. Um, let's see, and then there's, uh, this one I've never done, um, but it sounds really good. It says, there are key transition words such as if, then, therefore, likewise, but, because or in the same way. Used in those uh, paragraphs that you're reading. It says, draw an arrow to connect a concluding thought or its beginning argument. Is an idea confusing? Write your question in the margin to address it at a later time. This is important because you don't want to just skip over that or say, oh, I'll, I'll learn that later. Because it's, it's part of that text that you're studying, and you're not going to get the whole picture if you're not knowing what certain things mean. Um, and having an English dictionary close. Um, nowadays, you can just do it on your phone. You can Google it. Uh, I had downloaded that. Uh, I think it's a 1928 or 48 dictionary, the real old one that refers to the Bible. And most modern dictionaries don't do that. So using even different ones uh, that you're comfortable using, because it helps you understand the word and how it's used. It might even be a word that you are familiar with, but maybe in this sentence structure, it's used differently. So uh, it's always good to look up the word and be clear on what it means. By slowing down and considering the meanings of keywords or unfamiliar words, we move toward comprehension. Other translations of the Bible is another thing, another tool to use. Um, outlining, this is one I know a little bit about, and Mark's offered to teach me a little bit more, <laughs> so I'm not so long-winded. <laughs> but. Um, he says if you outline, he show me how to use keywords and stuff to, to prick my memory of what I've studied so I don't have to handwrite it all out or type it all out. And um, stage two is interpretation. Uh, what does it mean? A person who interprets the creation story can tell you why God created it in a particular order or way. She's able to deduce things from the text beyond what it says. This means that it is good for us to earnestly attempt interpretation on our own before we read the interpretation of others. Commentary, study Bibles, podcasts, blogs, and paraphrases, cross-references, they are all excellent helps. And... Uh, I think last week she even told us that if we're in a season where we don't have a lot of time when, when we have a new baby or we're caring for an elderly person, uh, these things are excellent tools until we can get more time, until we're blessed with more time to really um, put our efforts into it. But always don't take, don't take their word for it. If you have a question, you always go back to the Bible and search it out so you know if that person's telling you the truth or not. Very, very important. Uh, and then the stage three is the application. How, it sh how should it change me? Uh, what does this passage teach me about God? And how does this aspect of God's character change my view of self? What should I do in response? Um, if God's uh, teaching us to love our enemy, as he tells us in Matthew 5, 
Well, we've been taught all down through history, eye for an eye. I don't know if it's a tooth for a tooth, but eye for an eye. <laughs> um, that we should, um, you know, do justice on our own. In the New Testament, he's telling us that justice belongs to God. Uh, revenge belongs to God. There's several reasons. God knows, and he sees more than we see or know. So to trust him, and it may take time. I want you to know that. It may take time for us to see God working in a situation that we would have retaliated right away not using, not thinking, not seeing like he does, uh, not knowing the purpose. There might have been a purpose for all that happening in your life, what you're going through. Uh, and you might not even see it until like you're older and you come in contact with someone that is going through a similar problem or situation that you dealt with. And now God's giving you the opportunity to... Uh, share with that person. Let them know they're not alone. Let them know how God protected you, how he worked through what happened out for good for you. Um, just, uh, opportunities for God to use us. And that's what the application is for. Um, revenge if we got revenge in our way, we probably would end up in prison or on, uh, what do you call that? Being electrocuted, uh, death penalty or whatever they do nowadays. Um, because we took matters into our own hands. And later on, we, our family might find out down the road that it really wasn't like what we saw. I mean that if you took something in your own hand and you retaliated um, without knowing everything and then come to find out you were wrong, man, that's a heavy burden and one that I would not want to be in charge of. <laughs> I would much rather wait in that waiting room that is so hard to wait in Trust me, it's very hard to wait in sometimes for God to have his justice done. Not ours, but his. And in a way that will affect the person who has done wrong in a way so much more um, to where, even to the point where that person might receive the Lord into their hearts because they've seen the wrong they did. They've acknowledged it. They've repented of it. And they have learned of God's forgiveness. And they ask him into their heart. If we just retaliate and we get our revenge, that person may not ever have that chance. And I know in the moment, in the heat of the moment, we honestly might not want that person to have a chance. And I'm being honest with you. But that's not how God's word teaches us. And uh, if we want to be more like him, we have to, to sit back. We have to take a breath. We have to say, God, I don't understand this. I don't understand what's happening right now. I don't know why you allowed this. I don't know why that person made that decision to hurt my loved one um, or hurt me, you know. Sometimes you just can't, you can't see. And um, so you have to ask God, God, you know I'm a sinner too. And God, you forgave me. And maybe my sin was not as bad as theirs. But you tell me sin is sin. And um, you forgave me. Help me to forgive them. And help me not 
to become, like them or worse. Help me to be a light and not a hindrance to that soul that's lost. I know growing up I learned to look at people and their souls, not just their actions. God tells us that we're not, it's not that person that is, um, I mean, that person's being used by Satan to accomplish what Satan wants. And he wants us not to be close to God, not to think like God, not to act like God. And so he's going to use every and any little thing to uh, draw us away from God's word. And so when we're studying his word and it's living inside of us, that's harder to do because we're more actively thinking like God. We're more actively responding like God would respond. Um, and, and I'm not saying it's easy because it's not. But it's not impossible because all things are possible with God. And you have to tell yourself that. And you have to tell, you, tell yourself that you have a great big wonderful God, a God who always watches over you. He's with you every step of the way. He works everything out for your good, whether you can see it or not at the moment. We have to remind ourselves these things because Satan is trying his best to make us forget. And that's a very important part of the application of what we learn about God. We're learning more and more about him, and we're learning how to become more like him. And um, Satan's going to do everything he can to distract us, to make us angry, to make us uh, act out in ways that aren't pleasing to God, that hurt. Uh, I want to say God's reputation. It's not just ours. We're representing God. And um, when we act or react wrongly, that's telling others or showing others that God doesn't make a difference in your life. And um, so it's something important to remember, okay? Studying with process allows us to uncover the character of God in Scripture through careful comprehension and interpretation. It's kind of what we just talked about. It then allows us to properly apply scripture in the light of who God has revealed himself to be. Let's go to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 in your Bible, verses 19 and 20. Give you a second to get there. I remember hearing these verses when I was a teenager and just pricked my heart. Verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? This is King James. Which is in you, which you have of God. God's given you his Holy Spirit to live in you. With, um, Jeff, God, and ye are not your own. We're not our own anymore. God bought us with the price of his blood on Calvary. And we belong to him when we ask him into our heart. We belong to him. And so it says, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And man, as a teenager, you don't, you don't think like that. <laughs> Everything's about you. And um, that really opened my eyes to, oh, my gosh. I've got to look at things a little bit different. I've got to react to things differently. Um, otherwise, God's not going to uh, be, uh, people aren't going to see him in me. They're not going to see the difference that he's made in my life, in my heart, my mind, my soul. You know, so this is a good verse to underline and remember because uh, 
Our bodies are not our own anymore. They belong to God. He paid for them with his precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ, on Calvary. And Jesus rose from the grave and took that sacrifice unto God and said, these are covered in my blood. They are mine. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, just think about that for just a moment. You are his. You're covered in his blood. You are precious to him. If you did what Jen asked you to do and went to Genesis, printed it out, um, went day by day what was created, and then, you know, did the whole thing that she taught us in the chapter, uh, writing or circling or squaring off things that were repetitive, uh, and God saw that it was good. Oh, he saw that it was good. When, he see, when God sees us, he's looking through those rose-colored glasses, through the Christ's blood, and he sees that we are good through Christ. That is totally awesome. A truth that you should cling to, appreciate, share with others. You know how many people out there, I, mean, I was a teenager, and growing up, things happened to me that should never happen to a child. Uh, trusts were broken, um, and a lot of people go through broken homes, uh, broken homes, a broken home, I mean, and um, no dad to grow up with. You know, just things that other people go through, too. It wasn't just me, it was other people, too. And um, you feel dirty inside. You don't... You don't feel worthy of anything when you're treated that way. And you don't feel like you can trust anybody. Oh my gosh, if you've had abusive parents or uh, uncles or aunts or whoever in your life was abusive to you, and you're hearing about God and how he loves you, how are you going to trust that? You've never been able to trust anybody. And so when you've experienced these things personally, and you can share it with someone else. You can show them in God's word. You can uh, share how he worked in your life, how you felt when you were going through that situation. That is such a powerful witness that um, makes God's word come alive to someone else who is very hungry to hear it. So we have a very important job, and we want to do it right. We want to honor our God and bring him glory. We want to see souls be saved. We want to see uh, young babes in Christ to grow and mature and be able to turn around and share what they've learned with other people, uh, turn around and love their family in a way that maybe they weren't loved. Um, you know, to be able to love your enemy. God loved us, and we were his enemy. Don't forget that for a moment. We were his enemy. We were just like those people back in the day when they crucified him, yelling, crucify him. We were his enemy. And he died for us because he loved us. We can love him. Not because we loved him first. Uh-uh. We didn't want anything to do with him. Because God loved us, he supplied a way for us to become his child. And that's something you don't take for granted. And you cherish. And you share it with others. You don't hold it inside. It's exciting. Exciting to be loved by someone who's, who loves you regardless of what you do. Not to say that you can just do anything you want. But we make mistakes. We're human. We have human sinful bodies. But the spirit that lives inside of us, that's pure. And that's God's. And we need to take care of it. We need to take, take that responsibility and study his word. Make him ours in more ways. I mean, we're already his, but make him ours. Um, do for him what he did for us. 
in the best way that we can. And that's to be true to his word and to share it with others. So I hope you enjoyed this study. Um, it, it's a very good study, and she has a lot of good points. It's, it's impossible to cover everything, but that's why you have homework. That's why you read it ahead of time. I'm not here to tell you every step by step. Um, you know, in your own time, when God allows you moments to have with him, Use them wisely. Um, and don't ever think that you don't have enough time. God gives you what you need at that moment. And he understands. He sees what you don't think he does. Just like Rahab. Just like David hiding in the caves. Just like Ruth leaving her family, her, her hometown, and following her, her mother-in-law to a country she's heard about, a God she's heard about, and she's wanting to find out more. God sees these things, and he honors your actions. So um, let's see here. We're going to consider the next P and the final P of her five Ps of sound Bible study, and that's to study with prayer. Um, and I recommend that before study and after study, during study if you're having trouble, especially if you're having trouble understanding, make those notes, look them up, ask um, for wise counsel in your church, uh, someone who has experienced it and went through it, uh, what that scripture meant to them. Just, um, you know, use it wisely. Pray about everything. Prayer is so important, and God taught us that. Jesus taught us that when he was on the earth. Prayer, talking to your Heavenly Father, is the most important part. Sharing is important. Um, caring, um, growing, loving is the most important. When you love, everything falls in place. When you put God first, everything falls in place. God is glorified. To him be the glory. You have a great week, and I look forward to talking with you next week, okay? God bless. Love you.